Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. A big warm welcome to everyone and a huge thank you for joining us for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission, as always, is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature that spans a whole range of genres to book lovers all around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I am Darren Kazanko, sci-fi and horror author, reader and one of your hosts and co-founders of Australian Book Lovers. And I'm Veronica Strachan, also known as V.E. Patton, fantasy, memoir and picture book writer, reader and your other co-founder and host. And I jumped in before you told us which traditional owners are yes. the custodians of the land where you are. Absolutely. <laughs> I am coming today. You took a breath and I leapt in. <laughs> <laughs> I am coming to everybody today from Corner Country. Excellent. And I am on Wurundjeri country. Uh, Woiwurrung is the, the language of the custodians up here. Wonderful. Just outside Melbourne or Nam, as we also know. Well, what a special episode we've got today. This is a very exciting episode. Super exciting. And it's called Australia Reads. This is, uh, you know, we are offering an extra bonus for our listeners and for anybody who downloads the podcast. So Australia Reads, I might have told you a few episodes ago that I'm an ambassador because, you know, let's face it, I love reading. I think people get that now. And Australia Reads is an initiative to read more books more often. So they're uh, on a mission to get people reading. And as we know, we've talked about this, the benefits of reading. Uh, really, reading is a key to a smarter, healthier, happier nation. So research shows that reading can be a great way to improve your cognitive abilities, relax your body, lower your heart rate, and enhance how happy you are with life. Sounds Just like pretty a good. Magic combination. Definitely. So this is kind of driven by a, a common passion for reading and establishing creative connections. And it's the work of groups of illustrators, storytellers, publishers, and uh, booksellers, all keen to get people to stop scrolling and start reading. You know, basically they want people to put down their phones, turn off the telly, pick up a book and read it for 10 minutes a day. And so one of these initiatives is to have on Tuesday, the 14th of September, one hour reading. Now we know that while the ideal is for you to actually pick up a book, take your eyes off the screen and turn the pages, not everybody's going to have time for that. So we've asked our authors, uh, all the Australian book lover authors, their books are all on the website, if they would give us a few minutes, either a chapter or a special verse or just the opening of their books. And we were just blown away by the number of people who said, yes, quick, why don't I record a few minutes for you? Oh, it's so, been absolutely spectacular. This yeah. is going to be amazing. Yeah, it, totally. Our authors are just brilliant. Whenever we put the call out that we are looking for something or we want to do some kind of, you know, promotion or, or game or donation, they are in. So we have got, wait till you hear what we've got. We've got dark fantasy, historical fiction, contemporary romance, light-hearted fiction, horror, of course. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> We've of, course, got... of course, a good horror book, uh, I'm sure, still falls in that category of lowering the heart rate and <laughs> I was just going to say, I don't know that I'd call that relaxing or lowering your heartbeat, but anyway, it's still stimulating your brain. Yes. Uh, romance, uh, climate fiction, science fiction, We've got LGBTQIA plus romance. We've got YA. We've got biography. We've got a mystery thriller. Um, but what else have we got here? Dystopian sci-fi and, of course, fantasy. So, yeah, that, that is a pretty good list. Oh, that is a huge list. And talk about like a treasure chest of audio gold. Rather than just an audio book, this is like a, a whole... I don't know, surprise package of all little audio uh, sneak previews. and Yes. Uh, like do you remember the Reader's Digest? Are you, you're probably not old enough to remember the Reader's Digest. I My, do remember the you Reader's You do? Digest. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I am Joe's foot and those kind of things. But what they did have, which I loved, um, was 
just little stories, short stories. And so while these aren't short stories, it was just enough to get you interested and to fill a few minutes. So our recordings go anywhere for sort of two or three minutes up to sort of, you know, 15, 20 minutes, some of the, the longer ones. So we're kind of averaging around about six or seven minutes each. So enough to let you hear the voice, not only of the author, but of the story and to get a sense of what the story's about. Um, some of the authors uh, introduce what the story's about as well. And uh, yeah, so I should just stop talking and we should just cut to the authors. Well, yeah, before we do that, <laughs> I, I, I think I just want to say that, uh, you know, being that it's Australia Reads, if anyone is listening to this podcast, which I hope that's lots of people, and uh, are using this, you know, special day to maybe um, just edge them back into the land of reading if, if, mm. if they haven't had that time to read before and they've decided they're going to dedicate a bit of time. There is no better way to maybe have a bit of a discovery of what you might like to read by, by listening to all of these beautiful, stunningly awesome readings by these authors. Because, you know, no matter what genre you like, no matter what sort of tale you like that tells you, curls your toes, sorry, um, there's going to be something in this beautiful podcast that will absolutely want to ignite your imagination. So wherever you are sit back and listen and just enjoy and a huge thank you to all of the authors for putting together such an amazingly special show brilliant let's go okay here we go everybody hi there this is laurie bell Today I'd like to read to you a small section of my novel The Good, The Bad and The Undecided, which is a collection of 12 short stories set during the thrilling events of Whitefire, a Tony Dell adventure. Location. The Unspoken Lands. This is all your fault. Steve hissed the accusation at his older brother as they were escorted, pushed, along the endless grey corridor towards Galleon's office. Their usual contact was Dalmuth, Galleon's right-hand man. That the boss himself wanted to see them could only be bad. The oppressive heat from outside had followed them in, and sweat dripped down the centre of Steve's back. This argument had been going on for a while. Kel just didn't grasp how serious the situation was. Galleon did not summon you to his office on a whim. Steve, where is go-to, guys? Our shipping routes, my shipping routes... Yeah, well, your shipping routes are the best, and so are our teams. Even with our low costs, we get the job done. He'll be fine. We just have to explain it was a one-off. Steve stopped walking, not even trying to keep the incredulous expression off his face, stunned by his brother's lack of foresight. The gill behind them hit Steve in the back hard. He jolted forward, glaring at the guard over his shoulder. The beast-like snout didn't hide the sharp-looking fangs projecting from his fat lips. Bloodthirsty and violent, it was not surprising Galleon had Gil guarding his apartment. I was on a winning streak, okay? Look, Galleon's cool, he'll understand. Steve wanted to clip his brother over the ear to make him see sense. He didn't. Kel would punch the Shengi out of him. And then there was the Gil behind him. Now was not the time to be physically aggressive. He worried it would only encourage the Gil to violence. He won't understand. You put the whole project behind schedule. I can't protect you this time, Kel. You can't be so stupid that you don't see that. I don't need you to save me. You don't know what you need. Steve grumbled loud enough for his brother to hear him. Kel frowned. You worry too much. The gill shuffled closer and sniffed at Steve's sweat-soaked collar. Steve squirmed at the touch of the sticky tongue licking the moisture off his neck. He twitched away and fell against his brother's weedy body staring back at the gill mesmerised by the saliva hanging from its fangs. People that call gill ugly have never seen one up close, Kel muttered. Steve spied the sweat, beating at the white skin of Kel's receding hairline. It exposed his true feelings. So he was worried. Yeah, this is not going to end well for either of us. Steve ran his fingers through his own damp hair. The gill sniffed at the stink rising from Steve's underarm, the sound turning Steve's stomach. Move. Meaty hands encouraged Kel forward. There was a loud crunch and Kel groaned. Steve shuffled forward before he received the same motivation. You alright? Never better. The girl grinned, slack skin pulling back to expose his sharp teeth, like a picture straight out of a childhood horror story. 
He chuckled. At least Steve assumed it was a chuckle. The sound that emerged reminded Steve of his lightship's generator. He shot a look at his brother. The smirk dancing at Kel's lips said he'd made the same connection. A rare moment of camaraderie between the siblings. Delay over, their procession continued down the austere corridor until they were stopped by a sealed door. A beam of light sprang forth from a port in the doorframe, scanning them for weapons, before the door, as thick as the gill's arm, swung inward. It seemed that Galleon did not welcome uninvited guests. Steve swallowed his fear and stumbled into the sharply lit room. Okay, so this is a chapter from Making March called Ding Dong Delivery. 16th of February, 2017, 9am. I was just about to make my morning coffee when the doorbell rang. Who the hell rings your doorbell at 7.30am? It was a courier driver delivering another new toy. I had completely forgotten that I had purchased it on a whim at the kitchen tea. The courier driver was very good looking. He was tall, buff and handsome with wavy dark hair and piercing blue eyes. I felt my face flush a little as it suddenly dawned on me what was inside that box. He gave me a cheeky little wink as I signed for it and he turned to walk back to his van. Yes, of course I checked out his backside, wouldn't you? I was very grateful that I was home to accept receipt of delivery as I avoided having to pick it up from the post office. The box had a rather large, colourful and glossy label that contained a picture of the product. It is a very realistic looking dildo. That would have been slightly embarrassing. I was just about to throw the box in the recycling bin when I noticed a brochure hiding right down the bottom. Curiosity got the better of me and I fished it out of the box. Well, let me tell you, I heated up my cup of coffee and sat down to have a look at what it had to offer and it was rather amusing. The brochure was advertising life-size male sex dolls. These latex lads look so realistic that it was quite frankly a little bit disturbing. You can buy all different coloured wigs in an array of hairstyles. You can opt for chest hair or a smooth torso. You can even buy carpet to match the curtains, if you know what I mean. There was the biggest catalogue of penis attachments I have ever seen in my life. You could order long and thin, short and thick, circumcised, uncircumcised, flaccid or erect. Well, I guess there's a market for everything. I guess every red-blooded woman has a preference when it comes to the shape and size of a man's penis. I personally prefer width over length myself. Let's face it, girls, what good is a nine-inch appendage if it's going to be like tossing a sausage down the hallway? Why is it that most women these days want their men to either wax or shave their chest? No, ladies, you've got it all wrong. I absolutely love a hairy chest. Men are supposed to be hairy. There is something extremely sex sex, sorry, sexy and primal about it. Nothing is better than running your fingers through all that manliness. I seem to be a very rare breed nowadays. I was born in the 70s after all. Maybe my mother gave birth to me on a shag pile rug. In fact, come to think of it, I can give you at least three reasons why dating a man with a hairy chest will always be a good thing. If your man has bare, smooth pecs, you are missing out, and here's why. Number one, he will keep you warm with his glorious patch of fluff. I call them luscious locks of love. You can snuggle up to it on a cold night. There is nothing like cuddling up to a warm, woolly mammoth of a man. He's like a human electric blanket. Number two, in prehistoric times, being extremely hairy was considered to be the ultimate sign of masculinity. The hairiest man was probably the alpha of the tribe. That has not changed, ladies. And number three, being a man with a hairy chest changes, being with a man with a hairy chest changes a woman. I'm serious. It makes you want to do dirty things and you can grab onto him quite literally. What a ride. It's not only chest hair I find attractive. I love a bit of facial hair or a lot for that matter. What's not to like? Kissing a bearded man is more fun. It tickles in a nice way and that, my friend, is sexy. It also feels lovely when it brushes against your inner thighs if you venture south of the border. A bearded man, a beard makes a man look much older and more distinguished in my opinion. Women tend to be more attracted to older men and this has been proven throughout time and a bearded face screams, I am a man, a beastly man. Have you heard the term lumbersexual? It refers to being attracted to men who resemble a lumberjack. Yes, girls, it is a real thing. Who doesn't want a man who looks like he could build you both a fire and a house with his bare hands? There is no denying that is very attractive. Now, back to the product at hand. If an oversized, creepy looking doll with a realistic penis is your kind of thing, I suppose that could be okay. Look at it this way. 
It's got to be better than having your neighbours call the police to your door as they think they may have heard a loud gunshot as you leapt onto your blow up doll and it popped. Oh well, I might go and check my dating profile. I swear, if this time turns out to be just another frustrating flop and waste of my time, I may just decide to spend the rest of my life with Bob, battery operated boyfriend. Hi, I'm Avril Drummond, and my novel is called Gloam, which is the name of the planet where all the action takes place. This is a book that doesn't fit easily into any particular genre, but it can be found on the Australian Book Lovers site in the sci-fi section. Gloam is a climate change novel, but I didn't want to make it too miserable, so it has plenty of romance, action, and even a little humour. Lots of things happen to the characters, but I don't want to give anything away. So here is a short reading from near the beginning of the book. Rosie, who is one of the main characters, is waking up on the morning of a school excursion to a place called the Glade. This excursion really will change her life. In fact, it will give her a life, but of course she doesn't know that. She is also um, using the time to have a little think about how rude she has been to her lovely dad, Biley. There are a few of my made-up gloam words in this reading. I hope that won't be a problem. Rosie woke to the shaking of her bed. She was bouncing about a little. Obviously, she'd slept through the quiet vibration phase as usual. She lay on her back and looked through her window where a flock of birds wheeled in the azure sky. They were probably only pythons. That was about all you saw in the city these days. But she had to admit the sight of their white and grey bodies spiralling gracefully upward was pleasant. Azure. That was one of the words that she had learned in her high glumpish homework. She was really glad that the sky was azure. It meant that a sea breeze had blown the pollution away inland during sol down. She felt strangely peaceful, considering that she had to get up so early. Perhaps she was entering a new era of refinement and sensibility. She still felt a bit tired, though. She'd lain awake for quite a while thinking about her pa. She didn't mean to be rude to him all the time. Somehow she just couldn't help herself. She'd been able to hear what Anley had said to him from her study room. She'd resolve one thing at least. If she was going to be rude to him in future, she'd wait till they were alone. Suddenly the bed turned cold. Bugger her, she'd mistimed it. This was just like her ma. It had obviously been programmed for maximum discomfort. She leapt out before the icy stage could begin. So, if you want to know what happens to Rosie and how going on a school excursion can save your life, then you will just have to re gloam and find out. This chapter is brought to you by The Brotherhood of the Dragon, an Armand Galeas and Sebastian Volk mystery, book one in the Bloodline trilogy. The Brotherhood of the Dragon is available at Odyssey Books and on Amazon. Now, before I begin, I'll admit I am reading two chapters here as I try to keep this book fast paced and punchy, so the chapters are short and rather tight. Chapter 4 My head hurt. Actually, my head had already been hurting before my run in with the flat end of the shovel. It had been hurting ever since I woke up in bed in what was now starting to feel like days ago. What I meant to say was my head was no longer simply sore. It was now a source of complete and utter misery. It felt as though the shovel had split my skull in two, and it was still sitting there, like some handyman's Excalibur, waiting to be drawn out by the true King of England. Before my vision swam the face of my attacker, for some strange reason he looked concerned. Are you kidding around, Amon? Did I hit you too hard? Though a reply formed, it somehow got lost on the way out. Blarg, Mina, where is it? Come on, I did not hit you that hard. Frizzberger, Bill what? <laughs> Maybe I did hit you too hard. Though most of my motor functions seemed to have deserted me, the sharp pain in my head kept my mind focused enough to keep an eye on what my attacker was up to. He first got up and looked about, perhaps to make sure his ambush had remained unseen, and there was no one rushing to my rescue. 
Next, he returned to my side and removed a small tobacco tin from his top pocket. This he opened, and from within removed a butterfly, very similar to the one I had seen earlier, during my walk with Robin Stamford. The gardener took the insect and, forcing my mouth open with his left hand, placed it on my tongue. He then clamped one incredibly powerful fist over my mouth and nose, and almost politely said, Swallow! As hard as I tried to squirm from under his grip, the man effortlessly held me in place. Swallow, he said again, with more force. Already I could feel the fragile creature's body dissolving in my mouth as my body tried to dislodge the irritant by drowning it in saliva. I could feel the harder parts rubbing against the roof of my mouth and then starting to migrate down my throat as the butterfly disintegrated. Swallow it, the man said again, sensing my attempt to resist disappearing along with what air was in my lungs. For God's sake, I'm on. Just swallow the damn thing. Finally, my chest heaved and spasm as blissful unconsciousness approached. Just before I blacked out, I felt my throat automatically swallow, and once my attacker was sure I had not somehow faked everything, he released me. With a gasp, fresh cool air flooded my lungs, and my amnesia melted away like, well, like a butterfly on your tongue. Chapter 5 Though I rarely intervene in the activities of men, somehow enough people know about my past to ensure I still receive visitors in distress, hoping I have some knowledge or advice that could help them survive their time of need. Most are just lazy people with lazy issues, and those I happily send away. Occasionally, something or someone appears with a tale to tell that catches my attention. In these instances, I am happy to help. The world can be a dull place at time, so a new challenge or even just something to pass the time is a jewel to be treasured. If you are of the opinion that the butterfly was some magic potion that gave me back my memory, you are correct. I hate insects. I hate every kind of insect, but very specifically, I hate butterflies. Certainly they look pretty, and that is their evil genius. Underneath the gaudy colours and great luminous wings lies a filthy creature of coarse hair and black spider-like bodies. Have you ever looked closely at a butterfly's head? I mean really closely. Those enormous alien eyes, the giant proboscis that makes them look more like the drinker of souls in some 13th century religious manuscript about the tortures of hell rather than something little girls like to draw on their bedroom walls. Butterflies are the painted strumpets of the animal kingdom, and I do not trust them, not one little bit. The horror and disgust of having the incarnation of evil in my mouth helped destroy the intellectual block I had placed in my mind days ago. After so many years, I had become a creature of habit and lazy days. I have always tried to avoid work, confrontation, or stimulation where I could, but to remain living in the style I have grown accustomed to, well, that requires money. This of course means that when I do work, I do so to get paid so I can go right back to my comfortable chair and my books. Like any skill, knowledge requires upkeep, and I need time to remain the genius I believe myself to be. The fellow who stood over me was Sebastian Volk, and we had known each other for a long time. Certainly, he did not like everything I did, and I was none too happy about his success with the ladies, a problem, and his inability to gamble, not so much a problem, but an ongoing tragedy that threatened to doom us both. Not only did Volk bring his own unique gifts to our acquaintance, he was also of such a great age that he too was often up for an adventure to alleviate the boredom that came with being immortal and idle. His association with me ensured he got plenty of that. He was what you would perhaps call a friend. I wouldn't though, as I had little time for the man, but you may well consider us as such. Feeling better? Volk asked, hauling me to my feet with little effort, then patting my backside down as though as a clumsy child. I know this is a little earlier than you asked, but things seem to be progressing too fast for you to be lying about in bed. Taking my first unassisted steps, Volk guided me down one of the rear paths to a section of the garden that seemed unused. As we walked, he filled me in. I joined the ground staff like you suggested, and what a miserable lot they have turned out to be. Most of them are discharged soldiers who served with the general, though recently several older men have retired and been replaced by men who had served with the colonel. Most are as mean as the day is long and none of them know the first thing about gardening, which is probably the only reason I got the job. As we neared an enormous brick wall that I assumed ran the perimeter of the estate, the old dog pointed out a large pile of rubbish and what looked like a discarded barn door. What I want to show you is under there, and as far as I can tell, no one I have encountered has had anything to do with it. Unsure what it was, I approached the slab of wood carefully and tilted the door up by one corner. Underneath was a shallow pit, and about two feet down was the body of a man. Well, I assumed it was a man, and circumstances would later prove me correct. 
These chapters were brought to you by The Brotherhood of the Dragon, available at Odyssey Books and on Amazon. The music is by Ben Sound, and you can see more at his website www.bensound.com. Hello lovely readers, uh, my name's Claire Roden. I'm coming to you from Bunurong country in Melbourne southeast and I'm sharing with you today uh, the first chapter from my next book which is called How to Survive Your Magical Family and it's for readers aged 12 to 112 so coming out in October from Odyssey Books. We're starting with Toby and the street cat accident. A particular way with cats is the only magic I got from my father. I'm mostly a dog person, so cat magic isn't all that much use to me. My sister Helen copped a whole heap of practical skills. She can make traffic lights change green, check food in the fridge, imagine a parking spot into existence, or turn off the iron after she's left home, that sort of thing. But I'm stuck with this really boring, but completely reliable skill. I can charm any cat to come to me, any cat. Bashed up old streetwise tomcats, pretty little Persian kittens, world weary ginger dams, mad skittish rag dolls, and fat haughty Scottish folds. You name it, they have big cats too. I don't even have to sweet talk them, I just show up at the zoo. Lions and leopards, cheetahs and jaguars, panthers and tigers. From inside their perfect so called natural enclosures, they come as close as they can get to me and they rub their foreheads against the nearest wall. If the wall didn't exist, they'd push their heavy skulls against me, begging me to pet them. As I say, it's not a very useful piece of magic. I tend to avoid cats in general, and zoos especially. Cats just remind me that my father handed down only the shabbiest, least profitable iota of magic that any wizardling could want. Sadly, the feeling's not mutual. Cats keep coming to me. So when my sister breaks hard to avoid the collision in front of us, it's no surprise that the first thing I see is a tossing bundle of feline fur. The car that hit the cat stops for a few seconds. I can almost hear the driver sighing with relief. Phew, only a street cat. That's what she's thinking. She feels just bad enough, or maybe she's just squeamish enough to steer around the raggedy mound of road victim before she speeds off. My sister Helen yells obscenities at the other driver. She's so good at swearing that you could be forgiven for thinking it's a magical skill too. Then she flicks on her hazards and blinks a couple of times in that focused kind of way into her rear vision mirror. I look out the back window. Sure enough, a flashing blue light shows a police vehicle pulling up behind us. With our safety from other drivers secure, we both step out onto the wet road. Helen goes directly to the mangled cat, which is mewling like all the banshees of Ireland in an eerie noise making contest. As I feared, it's a new young mother stupidly trying to take her kittens one by one across the highway. There's a backup chorus of kittens wailing from the verge. By the time I look down, three scruffs of fur are grabbing at my ankles. See to them, would you, Toby? Sometimes I resent the way Helen takes charge. Usually I'm just grateful to her. This time it's a bit annoying because that's exactly what I was about to do. I don't always need to be told, but it's not worth arguing about. I bend down to gather the kittens. They're so small they fit into one of my hands. I bundle them inside my t-shirt, tucking it securely into the waistband of my jeans. I know that looks ridiculous, but at least they're safe. Their frantic mother is another story. I squat down beside Helen, who's trying to contain the stricken animal. The scruffy black cat bats at her, claws drawn. The fourth kitten still in her mouth, crying pitifully. What do you think? I don't like the look of it lying there in such a strange, twisted position. Helen shakes her head. Poor love, her back leg's broken. She's in such a lot of pain. I can't do anything until she lets me touch her. Toby, you speak to her. I look at my, over my shoulder at the police constable who's come to see how we're getting on, while his colleague directs the other drivers around us. It's not always a good idea to talk to cats when someone outside the family's listening. Helen, who pretty much always knows what I'm thinking, stands up with a smile at the policeman and takes him half a step away. I go down onto one knee, bending low until I make eye contact with the cat. Tenor, I whisper to her, your kittens are all safe. Let me have Littlest. Let him join his litter mates. I've got them all here tucked in my pouch. Pink and footsie and wart, they're all safe with me. 
okay, so I can read Kat's names too. Blame my dad. His middle name is Felix, which is the only other inheritance I've got. And by the way, no cat ever calls itself Felix. Tenna stops in mid-screech. She stares at me hard and then blinks. I see the fear in her eyes fade and with a sigh, she releases her ferocious grip on Littlest. I scoop him into my shirt too, where he clutches his siblings energetically, making a good few claw marks on my belly as he does it. I whisper to Tenna, your leg's broken, little mother. My sister can heal it and stop the pain, but you have to let her touch you. Think you can do that? Tenna is panting. You too, she sends to me, twitching her nose. Okay. I lay two fingers gently on her side. Helen, I call, can you help me lift this cat? Sure. Touching the policeman confidingly on his shoulder, Helen explains that we'll take the cats to the nearest veterinary practice. Then she comes back to us. Crouching beside Tenna, she places her palm on the cat's side and gives a strident whisper. Ready, set, go on. Tenna starts, her skin rippling up and down the length of her before she leaps to her feet. All four of them, sound as could be. I grin, shifting to a stand in time to take Tenna's bound into my arms. I can sense the relief and the joyous communion as mother cat and kittens fumble to smell each other through my shirt. We head back to Helen's car where I set the little family into the footwell of the passenger seat, resting on the old crocheted blanket from the back. I'm carefully placing one foot either side of them when Tenna looks at me, her eyes glinting green and hard. One more. One more? Tenna, you only have four kittens. Cat-like, she just stares at me. Helen, wait a moment, I say, backing out of the car. I just need to have a look around. My sister, bless her, is never unsympathetic just for the fun of it. Sure, Tobes, we'll just get off the road. Then I can wave goodbye to that cute police guy. While she draws the sedan over to the side of the carriageway, I walk slowly along the wet verge, scanning the ash belt where Tenor was struck, listening for any mewing. There's no sound other than the slish swishing of tyres on rainy road as the traffic sorts itself back into its usual pattern. There isn't even any blood. In the gutter, though, there is a silver bracelet. The bracelet is pretty battered and bent, but it truly looks like solid silver. I might have picked it up, except that I'm looking for something else. The bracelet has a charm clipped on it in a kind of round shape, but I'm still searching for something alive, so I walk right on, scanning the verge. Nothing. I turn and search again, heading back towards the car. The second time I pass that shining bit of silver, I can see that the round charm is actually in the form of a cat, and that the bracelet's more of a bangle and not so battered as I first thought. When I turn to look at it the third time, the round cat charm is seated upright on top of the bangle, looking directly at me. I give in. I'm not my father's son for nothing. Okay, I think cat plus charm plus silver equals magic. Though why Tenor thinks this is a kitten, I pick up the bangle. Oh. Turns out the bangle isn't just a bangle. Turns out Katkin, her full name is Katarina, but she likes the short form. Katkin's been looking for me for quite a while, magicked inside the bracelet. Tobias Felix is what she calls me, and as soon as I touch the silver charm, her voice starts in my head. Tobias Felix, do you know how lucky you are? Tobias Felix, do you know how magical you are? I do now. And hopefully you can find more of Toby's story in the book. Happy reading, everyone. Bye. Life in the Past Lane by Michael O'Brien In the beginning. At some stage in our life, we become curious about where we came from. We are told numerous myths by our parents that involve birds and bees and stalks and cabbage patches, until eventually we find out that we're an end product of the union between our father and our mother. They were the end products of unions between their own parents, and so on and so on and so on. One day, generally later in your life than earlier, you decide to trace all these unions and discover your heritage. And that's when you start to realise that if you had started the project a wee bit earlier in your life, it might not have been so bloody hard. I had decided to trim the weeds around my family tree not long after my father passed away. 
when I found an old letter that had been written to his sister by a distant cousin. The letter was like the blurb on the back of a Dan Brown novel, promising mystery and intrigue if you went further. Then a chance discovery of two rusted biscuit tins full of tiny black and white photographs of my mother's family piqued my interest further. Who were these people, and what did they do? A myriad of questions leapt in my head after I'd found that these family relics. But there was only my mother left to ask questions of, and she was quite ill. It appeared at present I was running out of future to uncover the past. Sadly, I did not have the opportunity to meet two of my grandparents, as they had passed away well before I was born. However, when I was younger, my father's mother and my mother's father had been alive and kicking. They used to visit our house regularly, and I would regard these two people with awe. God, they were old. Really, really old. My grandmother had shrunk with age. I was convinced that I could wrap her up and put her in my school bag. At Christmas time, she would always give me a pair of socks or a packet of hankies, and there would be a scrunched up five dollar note for my birthday. A good old fashioned paper note, not like the money made out of the hardened cling wrap that we use now. I would have to let my parents purchase my return present. I wasn't sufficiently mature enough to walk into a shop and buy elderly people's smalls. On the other side of the family, my grandfather, for one reason or another that had not been explained to Junior me, lived with us for some time. He wore pale blue cardigans, crisp Fletcher Jones trousers, dark brown Grosby slippers, and slicked his hair back with fistfuls of brill cream until it looked like each strand had been glued on. He went to the local senior citizen centre and made bowls out of paddle pop sticks and discarded bathroom tiles. I didn't show any interest in these creations. I was too busy playing cricket, kicking footballs, riding bikes or watching Marty and Emu on an enormous piece of furniture that we called a television. There was no doubt in my sunny boy and redskins addled mind that I was going to become a famous footballer or a cricketer or an astronaut or something. I simply didn't have time for these old people. And isn't that a shame? My grandfather died in 1979, my grandmother in 1994, and I still hadn't learned to appreciate them. All I had learned in those years was that I wasn't going to be a famous footballer or a cricketer or an astronaut, but I had discovered the existence and the delights of girls and alcohol. My previous experience with these things had been unremarkable and uninspiring. Girls couldn't play cricket, couldn't kick a football, they had long hair, they smelt funny, they played silly games, and their willies had broken off. As for alcohol, I'd watch my father drink fluid from gold-coloured cans that were labelled KB, and the more of them he drank, the more he laughed, the more lopsided he became, and the more he thought he was Al Martino. I remember thinking that when I am older, I'll drink this KB thing, and I too can be a grown-up. You must remember, I was only young. So basically, cricket and football and the moon and girls had been in a gold can, had stood in the way of me developing a substantial relationship with my grandparents. All I have left of their legacy are some yellowing hankies and a broken paddle pop stick bowl. I could have asked them about their lives and their families and their experiences. For instance, my grandmother was born in 1895. 1895? Australia, as we know it now, did not exist. It was only a handful of colonies that would not become a federation for another six years. There was no Prime Minister. Queen Victoria was on the throne of the United Kingdom. Orville and Wilbur Wright were still on the ground and not destined to change that status for a while. X-rays had only just been discovered. Ethiopia and Italy were at war. A bloke called Grover Cleveland was president of the United States. The first Mond Olympics were a year away. Oscar Wilde went to jail for his non-heterosexual activities. And George Selden painted the first gasoline-driven car. Bush Ranger Ned Kelly had been dead for only 15 years. Elsewhere in the world, some people only had 17 more years to live before a giant ship called the Titanic took them to the bottom of the ocean. 
my grandmother had lived a long life. In her time, she had seen six different British monarchs, nine Catholic popes, and 24 different Australian prime ministers, not to mention two world wars. My grandmother had been living history. Now that I am older and have developed a keen interest in my family tree, I have a thousand questions, but there's no one left to answer them. As I walk along the path in the forest, my feet are brushing the fallen leaves, and I find I am disturbing what is underneath. The path is not clear, and there is a mist circulating around me. I could have had guides to help me through the forest, but I'm on my own now. It is up to me to find my way to the end, which is really the beginning. In my quest to discover the family tree, I admit I was hoping to find some skeletons in the closet. Not only did I find them, they were swigging rum and dancing a wild tango when I got there. The secrets from the past slowly emerged. I didn't know whether these secrets had been hushed up by the family elders as they sipped tea and whispered quietly, sitting in comfortable recliner rockers in beige-coloured living rooms, or if the winds of time had blown them out of their memories. It didn't matter. My job was to uncover the secrets, not pass judgment upon them. This book tells the tales of many journeys. It tells of people who left their homeland and everything they knew and came to an unknown country in search of a new and better life. Some of them had no choice but to leave. The authorities had decreed it was that, or face an appointment with the hangman's noose. Some of my ancestors found a better life in Australia, and some did not. But all of them did what they did for one reason, a reason that has kept humans going for centuries. Survival. For some people, the unknown is better than the known. It is also an insight into historical times and what my family experienced within that chronology. To know what year your ancestor would, was born is interesting. To know what living in that year was like is fascinating. It puts perspective into your family tree. It puts life into their lives. This is their story, my story, and history. Hello, I'm Catherine McCullough, and I'm going to read for you from my latest historical novel, Secrets and Showgirls, which was published earlier this year and tells the story of a little cabaret in Paris during the German occupation of World War II. The story follows the fascinating characters who populate the cabaret as they navigate their way through the occupation, dodging the Gestapo and the French police and dabbling in the black market, all the while conscious that somewhere there is an informer who would love nothing more than to hand them all over to the Germans. In this scene, Lily, one of the cabaret's showgirls, listens to a snatch of conversation between the landladies of the boarding house apartment blocks where the cabaret's company resides. It is June 1940 and the German army is approaching Paris. Lily had little idea of any threat to her own safety and regarded the looming war as a quarrel between foreign politicians who were better left to sort out their problems in the far-off cities of London and Berlin. No one at the cabaret had discussed the notion of leaving, and Lily, leaning out of her apartment window one day, was surprised to hear Madame Fressange, the hawk-eyed landlady of the neighbouring apartment block, discussing the question, question with Madame Gloria. No, no, Madame, reassured Madame Gloria. We are perfectly safe. My Hubert is at the Magino line, and he says it is like a fortress. Your husband is mobilised, queried the other. I thought perhaps he was a little old for soldiering. Gloria beamed with obvious pride. Yes, I told him as much, she replied, but he refuses to leave the younger men to fight without a steadying hand. War is not new to him, you understand. He fought in the last war, you see. Madame Fressange greeted the mention of the last war with a spit and a curse. We should have been harder on the Bosch, she declared, her face contorted with disgust. The soft politicians punished them too lightly, and now they threaten us again. You mark my words, madame. This time they will do the job properly. We will all be under the German heel. But Madame Gloria's faith in Hubert was unshakable. Our forces will prevail, she persisted calmly. Our British, American and Belgian friends will help us just as they did last time. Belgians, spat Madame Fressange, who clearly placed her Flemish neighbours even further down the list than the German foe. 
And what use were the Belgians in the last war? Most of them ended up here, squatting in people's homes and cluttering up the parks. No, madame, we have to rely on ourselves. I hope your Hubert is every bit as good a soldier as you believe, because we will need a legion of Huberts to stem the tide of the Bosch. Unshakable belief or not, Madame Gloria was now keen to end her conversation with her neighbour and return to its opening parley. So you will leave, Madame? We should all leave, retorted the older woman. I have a daughter in Toulon and can stay with her if I wish. But this apartment is my home, it is my life, and I have no wish to see it vandalised by German soldiers. She paused to consider this awful prospect, emphasising her distaste with another spit. The rather more refined Madame Gloria grimaced at the watery splat of its collision with the pavement. No, grumbled Madame Fressange, I will stay for the moment and see what these useless politicians can do to prevent us all being murdered by the Bosch. She turned back to her neighbour. Let us hope for that legion of Hubert. On the floor above, Lily closed her window quietly and stood, lost in thought. War was not an inviting prospect. She too would have to place her faith in the soldiering skills of a man she had never met and who, by all accounts, appeared to be in the twilight of his years. It was a sobering prospect. Thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoyed that little excerpt and may you enjoy much more delightful reading in this, our special month of reading. The Decision They Made by Maria P. Frino, Chapter 6, Amelia, 1980. Cuddled together, the bombs are almost insignificant while she is in his arms. With Vladimir, she feels safe. No other man in her life treats her like he does. With kindness, respect, and a real love. A love that permeates her whole body. Darling, wake up! She hears another voice in the distance. Is that William's voice? Suddenly, a hand is on her arm, shaking her awake. Amelia, you're dreaming. Wake up. You are throwing your arms around yourself in your sleep. Was it a nightmare? What? Um, oh, she yawns. Yes, William, I guess it was. Sorry I woke you. No need to apologise. Are you okay? Do you want to talk about it? Oh, it was just a dream, she assures him. I won't bore you with details I can't really remember. Her aching muscles scream to be stretched, with her arms and legs splayed at full stretch. He says, what I will do now that I'm awake is have a cup of tea. Would you like one? She does more cat-like stretches, waking up her limbs before placing her legs on the floor. Thanks anyway, it's too early. I'll stay in bed a little longer. Just as long as you're okay. The clock blinks 5am as she places her robe, then bends down kissing him. I'm fine, thanks darling. She isn't fine, but she does not want to concern him. This is something she has to deal with on her own. Before heading to the kitchen, she walks into their bathroom. Splashing her face, she stares into the mirror. Why now? Why is she remembering it all now? Her mind keeps going back to the worst time of her life. A time William was never a part of. A time she does not want him to know about. Turning away from the mirror, she walks towards the kitchen. The kettle whistles as she places last night's dishes back where they belong. Outside, the dawn light is beginning to oust the night. She yawns again, making her tea, then ambles out towards the deck. Making herself comfortable, her thoughts return to the past. They have been down in the basement all day, staying in each other's arms even after the bombs stop. As if they have no care in the world. You had better get back. Your father will worry. She gazes into his caring eyes. They are much brighter now, not hollowed shells as they were when she first lay eyes on him. I know, she sighs. All I want is to stay here on this blanket with you, but I have other responsibilities. How much damage do you think is up there? Not too much in this area. The bomb sounded a long way off. I am uneasy about the future though. There will be a time when they will hit Naples. For now we are safe. With all this danger around us, don't you fear for your life during your missions? 
His top lift lifts in a smart, slight smirk. I try not to think about it. We all do what needs to be done. My comrades follow my orders and my orders come from the top brass. We will follow orders until such time as the partisans have enough power. We are rallying support. There are many more pacifists like us. We will prevail. What we need are lead leaders who are pacifists, she says, as she raises her head from the comfort of his chest. Stretching her arms upwards, she hits the shelf. Dust unravels its way down on top of them. Oh darn, sorry, I do forget how little room we have down here. I'm not complaining, Amelia. This basement keeps me safe and hidden. Without your help, I would probably be dead by now. She kisses his forehead, ignoring his mention of death. There is too much of her around. Them. I will bring him some food after dark. Only if it is safe. In fact, it might be best to wait until morning. Troops will be scouring around after the bombings. She pulls him towards her, kissing him passionately before leaving the base. Her beautiful Soviet lover, a man who takes up twice the space she does, is not easy to keep hidden. She has only managed to do so because she is the only one with a key. There is no reason for anyone else to come into this basement. Once outside, she scans the lane. Fear keeps everyone indoors. Vladimir had been right. The bombs were further away again. She also wonders how long before they hit this area of Naples. This war. There had been talk for years. No one believed it would happen, but it has. At a brisk pace, she returns to her apartment. All quiet. Teodoro, her father, is not home yet. Her breath filters through her body again. She doesn't even realise how often she holds it in. Busying herself with preparing what little food they have left, she hopes this war will end soon. Food is already scarce, and the news reports don't give people hope. Taking out the wilted endive, one tomato and an onion, she decides to make a stew with the chicken bones left from the chicken Teodoro had somehow acquired. She does not ask how. In fact, she rarely speaks to her father because when he is around, he is the one who does all the talking. Sober or drunk, he is the master. Simona and Marco, her sister and brother-in-law, would arrive soon. If Teodoro is not drunk when he arrives home, it might be a decent evening. Even Marco will not confront him when he is drunk. Instead, he and Simona leave for the safety of their own apartment. This is when Amelia has to deal with the abuse on her own. Looks like it might be another warm day. Are you feeling better? asks William, placing a kiss on her head. She had not heard him walk onto the deck. I'm fine, I told you that earlier, she answers, patting the spot next to her on the swing lounge. They sit together, peering out over the Pacific Ocean, watching the honey colours of the sunrise. Amelia is grateful for the life she has now. William is her husband. Hello, I'm V.E. Patton, author of the Opal Dreaming Chronicles. The Chronicles are an adult dystopian fantasy about the tangled lives of three women, scattered across time, but bound in prophecy to battle foes, friends, and their own desires, so they can wrest control of humanity's future from a pantheon of treacherous deities and reunite their splintered soul. I'm going to read a little bit of chapter two. It's about Alin Tomorrow, and in tech-ruled post-crack Earth, Ali's humdrum life under the Melbourne Dome is becoming weirder and more like a fantasy novel every day. Daydreams The ten tenets were created by the people for the people. They are to be followed by all people. Cultural guardians will ensure compliance by order of the Federation Committee. Excerpt from Melbourne Dome the Ten Tenants, Year One, PC. The dual computer screens blurred, and Alinta Morrow sandpapered her lids, rubbing out the grittiness of exhaustion for the tenth time in as many minutes. Geez, I'll need an optical region if I keep this up. I shouldn't let these things slide so far. 
She knew how hard it was to get permission for tank time if a critical body part deteriorated, even at her job rank. Yet the Federation castigated anyone who couldn't complete their allocated work on schedule and on budget, a budget that did not include sick leave or tank time. Who wants to spend days in the sensory tank anyway? She grimaced at her own sarcasm. Imagine days of doing nothing, time to think, reflect, relax, just floating in a sea of protein, heaven on a bloody stick. Weariness dropped her head to the back of the chair, and she inhaled a lungful of the musty, recycled air. Her dark lashes fluttered down, shutting out both the dreary office and the ubiquitous Federation-mandated Watch out for your neighbour sign, plastered above her screens. She drifted. Ellie had a gift for memory and order, perceiving the world in patterns and seeing sequence and symmetry in her mind in glorious three-dimensional detail. She could keep track of and connect millions of people, items, events and dates in her head. And she could access this secret third eye tapestry with her physical eyes open, if she chose. As a child, she'd thought her gift magical, and imbued it with a character of its own. It was a laughing ochre red dragon who flew through her mind and her world, weaving rainbow threads from the tips of her shiny black talons, and blasting fiery holes in imaginary monsters to make Ellie laugh. When she'd first realised that other people didn't see the world with a textured rainbow overlay, She'd been afraid. Her gift made her different. And different was not what you wanted to be in the Dome. Especially when you were already a Federation ward living on borrowed everything. The Child Centre supervisors had called her a liar and a cheat for her aberrant wisdom and frequently threatened her with realignment from the Grey Shirts, the Federation Committee's cultural enforcers. Her mostly older dorm mates labelled her a weirdo they beat and bullied her into a ghostly, silent existence until an education lottery plucked her from obscurity at ten and transferred her to a school in the North Quad. So for decades, Ellie had kept her wealth of knowledge to herself, learning to only display her skill with a middle-of-the-road anonymity. Not too smart, not too stupid. Something average and boring. Average and boring kept you under the grey shirt's radar, which is where you needed to be in the Dome. Despite every cultural decree ever issued by the Federation Committee, interactions with the grey shirts were not good for your health. There's got to be something better than this. Year after dismal year of the same grey, dull monotony. If only I had some real bloody magic, then I could zap myself away to somewhere better. Magic. That was Ellie's not-so-secret obsession. Scant though fiction was in the Dome, she nurtured her childhood illusions by reading anything and everything she could about magic and fantasy. She was lucky. Most Domers didn't get to handle real books anymore. Post-crack, hard copies were only for libraries, the museum, and rich collectors from the Dome's East Quad. But her project work involved cataloguing those East Quadders' collections, while everyone else had to rely on their Fedcom-issued and very temperamental personal communication device, their Comly. Ellie especially loved stories with feisty heroines and fire-breathing dragons. It was harmless escapism that helped her navigate the endless drudgery of life in the dome with wishful thinking. Imagining herself as a dragon with mysterious talents was one of her favourite entertainments in long, boring meetings. She'd picture herself using various special powers to escape from the room in unusual ways, or plan what mythical or lowly creatures she'd turn each of her colleagues into if she could. Her sometimes untimely smiles at her own antics drew a few odd glances. A few odd glances were fine. They kept people from getting too close. As if anyone would want to get close to little old me anyway. Most of Ellie's colleagues were younger, and spent their time and energy wheedling and jostling for the attention of Ali's boss, climbing the job ranks as fast as they could. At 52, Ali had no ambition for rank or privilege. She'd made peace with her ordinary life, mostly. Her plans for conquest lived only in her dreams, along with her dragons. 
yearning tickled the edge of her awareness, tugging at her gift, frustratingly close. It was always this way when she thought about dragons and magic. She felt something swim nearer, brightening as it eased through the murkiness in her mind. A familiar sense of... something. No. Someone. Impatient, she stretched towards that someone. The shadow behind her lids whirled from dark nothing into a shade of deep, dark red. Then the someone loomed, an enormous shadow crowding the space. Ping, ping. Alice calmly sounded a task reminder, its palm-sized plasma screen flashing, and whoever it was slithered away, leaving her bereft. A dismal black fog followed in its wake. Drats. Ali's gift, what had been her practically perfect picture of her own life, was now full of gaping holes, holes about which she had no clue. Starting about twelve months ago, missing hours, days, and sometimes weeks had begun to disfigure her previously unblemished memory. The absent sections made her edgy, and she sometimes felt as if her life was an unravelling tapestry whose threads she couldn't grasp to stop it disintegrating. Feck, I know it's there somewhere. This, this, whatever. I've forgotten something basic somewhere. I know I have. If I can find that one event, the rest will fall back into place, and everything will go back to where it belongs, including me. Another deep breath, eyes firmly shut, and she drifted deeper. The lean face of a biri, a young girl, glimmered into being behind her lids. Snow-white hair, shadow-blue skin, and a glimpse of eyes coloured like her own swung away to negotiate the steep bank of a verdant, overgrown creek. It's her. she dreamt of this biri before. Running water danced noisily over sharp black rocks, then divided into several streams each easing their way through scattered stone and deep red earth. A riotous tangle of green plants, bushes, trees, the kind of thing she'd only ever seen in history vids, worked together to deny the berry access. Ali's skin prickled with a breathless heat. She smelled fecund dampness and heard the crack of dry twigs crushed underfoot. Vibrant colours assaulted her wretched dome of senses. She squinted, her eyes burning in the bright sunshine. The dome's skin always filtered light to a muted, dismal beige, and its ever-present dust-grey coat dimmed the light even further. Robotic cleaners failed to keep more than a few square clicks clean at any one time. Ellie shook her head, but the dream remained. Why am I always dreaming about her? The flint knife slipped in the berry's sweaty grip as thirst kept her edging towards the water. Her swollen tongue tried to dampen cracked lips, and her stomach growled in chronic hunger. Ali felt herself slipping. She merged into the berry and knew in her bones the weeks of struggle, hunting for diminishing game and scrounging for wild berries as summer's warm bounty faded to autumn in the mountains. Unreal. Ali tried to pull out of the dream. Domers lived in steamy, humid, controlled sameness all year round and ate processed rations from the quad store. She slid back into the berry, at the mercy of the dream's strange virtual reality. Ali felt the berry's flutter of hopelessness and her hands trembled in sympathy. She paused, one palm steadying her descent on a branch, the bark rough and dry beneath her fingertips. Ellie glanced towards her hand, feeling the unusual texture, and blinked at a younger hand than hers with shadow blue skin grasping the tree limb. What the? Insects hummed, birds screeched, and a tickling breeze sighed, playing with her fine white hair, snagging and loosening her long braid. Someone was watching. Dee waited. Slowing her breathing, she wished herself invisible wished her magic was more reliable, and that she could access her grace, her storehouse of magic, at will. Dee had felt this watcher before, the brown lady. A second heartbeat. Surprise. A red lady, too. 
she'd never had two at the same time. Unlike most of the beings that haunted her existence, the intention of the two women felt distant, harmless. Yet they were closer than ever before, the brown lady almost as though she moved under her skin. No, I am not she. I am Dee, she croaked. And I'm freaking Allie, Allie declared, though the beery Dee didn't appear to hear her response. Allie tried again to disengage without success, though she could sense her own hands now, glowing a soft but insubstantial red. She became aware of another woman watching and turned to see her coming closer. When she looked directly at her, she could see the trees through the woman's body. Damn it, what the bloody hell is happening? Who are these people? Ali tried to wake herself, but the dream refused to let go. Dee wiped her sweaty palms on her coarse brown trousers, moving the knife to her left hand. Tucking in a stained grey shirt with her right hand, she stepped to the edge of the creek. Taking a last scan of her surrounds, she squatted and leant over to scoop a handful of precious liquid into her mouth. The reflection in the water showed three surprised faces, all with one green eye, one blue. Dee pivoted to confront the others, her knife slashing at their bellies. Allie leapt back, her eyes snapped open, the chair thudded against the wall. She was back in her office, heart pounding, a fine sheen of sweat dampening her skin. Her mind refused to process what her eyes saw the faint rosy glow of her fingers fading to brown. She blinked to clear her vision. Feck, what was that? Who was that? Where was that? The old man finally made up his mind. He decided that he wasn't going to go anywhere. His dead daughter's apartment might not have been his home for that long, but it was still a home filled with memories, both happy and sad. He looked around at what he would lose if he ran. He saw the markers of his dead daughter's success, the things she had owned, the symbols of what she had done, the things she achieved, achievements that he and his wife had devoted themselves to making possible, were more than enough to justify the toil that had dominated their lives. His dead daughter's apartment wasn't just all that he had left, but the summation of everything that he had worked and fought for. He looked again at what he would lose if he ran. Doing this only strengthened his resolve to stay. After all, he often felt that he had spent his whole life running. Long ago, when he was just a boy, he and his family had been robbed at gunpoint and force marched off their land. Weeks on a leaky boat had come next, followed by years spent being shuffled from camp to camp before given their chance to rebuild their lives in a country far from home. Maybe the moment had finally come. Maybe it was time to stop running, time to stop fighting, time to say that enough is enough. Besides, he was too old to try and start all over again, and far too proud to fail in the, in the attempt. And so the old man came up with a plan. Sit out on the balcony and greet the monster face to face. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't bring himself to call them unknown biological organisms or any of the other ridiculous names that people bestowed upon them. They were monsters, plain and simple. No amount of jargon or doublespeak would change that. He was halfway through making a cup of coffee to sip at while he waited for the monster to show itself when the alert light attached to his doorbell started flashing. Cursing aloud, he abandoned his coffee, shuffled across the room, then looked through the peephole built into the front door. Sally Frost stood on the other side of the door, utterly resplendent in the orange and blue uniform of a floor marshal. The old man didn't actually know her well, beyond the fact that her job involved a lot of travel, and yet she was one of the few neighbours who hadn't been embarrassed by his grief. She checked on him every couple of days, even if it was only a phone call from wherever her work had taken her. And here she was again, both knocking on the door and leaning on the buzzer. The old man was a fairly decent lip reader. He could see that she was calling his name, asking if he was in there. The old man didn't dare answer, didn't dare open the door. They all cared so much, 
but he knew that the only thing they wouldn't care about was his choice to stay. They wouldn't care about what he wanted and would drag him away against his will. It wasn't that they meant him wrong, that they, they just wouldn't understand. And so he turned away from the door. He waited and waited. After what felt like a long time, its alert lights stopped flashing as Sally gave up and moved on. The old man finally made his cup of coffee. He shuffled out to the balcony, dusted off an out there outdoor chair and then made himself comfortable. The sky was a shade of blue that painters only dream about. It was a beautiful sight, the city beneath it peaceful and calm. The old man drank it in, leaning back in his chair, but soon enough something began to trouble him. It was too peaceful, too calm. No matter where he looked, he saw nothing to break the stillness. There were no crowds, no traffic, no hustle, no bustle. The footpaths were empty, the roads were empty. Even the pigeon, pigeons, magpies, miners and seagulls had disappeared. It was as if the city was holding its breath and standing perfectly still in the hope that the beast might not notice it. And then something moved. The old man felt his chest tighten, but he couldn't tell whether it was because of fear or because of anticipation. He removed his glasses, wiped them clean on the tail of his pyjama top before leaning forward and looking again. Speeding down an otherwise empty street was a car that looked no bigger than a child's toy. It shot through an intersection before spinning out of control and crashing into an office building. At first, the old man worried that someone might be hurt, but then three people bailed out of the car and disappeared into the building, only to reappear moments later weighed down with all manner of stolen goods. The fight hadn't even started and already the looters were out. Vultures and parasites had always made the old man sick, and he turned away and looked to the southern horizon. Barely realising it, he pulled the half-empty cigarette pack from the pocket of his dressing gown, plucked one out and lit it up. He didn't care anymore. If the decision has been hit, had been his, he would let the monsters have the world without a fight. He sipped at his coffee and smoked another cigarette. He was happy to wait as long as was necessary. He had all the time in the world, and he wasn't going anywhere. The monster finally appeared, a blurry sponge in the distance. Slowly, but not as slowly as you would have thought, it grew both closer and more distinct. The old man, man laughed out loud. It looked, looked, looked like nothing more than a child's drawing of something that might have been a lobster, or might have been a spider, or might have been both. Propped up on flagpole-like legs that supported a wetly shining carapace, a beaked head, and a tail as long as a bus. It was enormous and ridiculous in equal measure. The old man was surprised to find that it failed to frighten him. It drew closer to the city. It stopped suddenly and bit a great chunk out of a stately old tree lining a boulevard. Chewing slowly and methodically, it worked its way through the massive wooden foliage before throwing its head back and opening its mouth wide. Despite his deafness, the old man felt the monster's keening in his bones and in, the, and in the pit of his stomach. He pulled his hearing aid from his pocket, turned it on and then slipped it in place. The beast's cry was low and mournful, more a melancholy bellow than a ferocious roar. Thankfully, the klaxon blare of the alarms had stopped. The monster cried out again and it shook the old man, both literally and metaphorically. The beast shifted its legs, presumably ad adjusting its weight and destroying an office building in the process. Almost comically, it looked down at the destruction it had wrought and seemed to shake its head. It looked back up and cried out a third time, and then started walking again. It seemed to meet the old man's eye. Without breaking its gaze, the old man took another sip of his coffee before lighting another cigarette. Slowly, 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 the monster drew closer. You could almost see a smile on the old man's face. This chapter is brought to you by Horror, the first time America's paranoia infected the world. Every generation, the media is blamed for the unruly behaviour of the young. In the 80s, it was heavy metal. During the 90s, it was rap and computer games. Well, there was once a time when comic books were seen as the greatest danger to the youth of the world. 
and the American government decided it needed to do something about it. The Senate hearings into juvenile delinquency would not only change the comic industry forever, it inspired an age of true horror across the globe, allowing government-sanctioned witch hunts ruled by men like Joseph McCarthy to destroy the lives of everyday people as they looked for hidden perils in a seemingly dangerous world. And this all began with the war against comic books. With a cast that includes Alfred Hitchcock, Orson Welles, Joseph McCarthy, America's first serial killer, Albert Fish, Stan the Man Lee, and many others, Horror, the first time America's paranoia infected the world, is a tale based on the true stories of those affected by these strange times, and it's available at Marcosi Publishing and on Amazon. Chapter 21. Dangerously Sincere Not only was there vast social upheaval in the 1950s, in quick succession erupted the Korean War, the Israel-Arab Crisis, the Vietnam Conflict, the Cuban Revolution, and several old world empires lost their long-time colonies in Africa and Asia. Danger seemed to be everywhere in a world forever changed by the Second World War, and for many those changes meant a total erosion of their former way of life. The world had lost its innocence and had grown into a dark, treacherous place, full of nasty creatures with names like terrorist, communist, socialist, and many other words ending with ist. Parents began seeing these diseases spread into their world and creeping towards their children. The young were becoming infected by these outside influences and had begun rebelling. Nobody was sure what they were rebelling against, just that these kids complained that they were rebelling against whatever they got. Nobody was sure what they were and exactly what it was they got, not to mention why it incensed the youth so much. It really was a confusing time for everyone involved. Juvenile crime seemed to be on the rise and the kids were becoming increasingly unruly and disrespectful, and a word entered the lexicon for the first time to describe these troublesome kids. Teenagers. What could be the cause of this trouble? What evil light was being shone on the children to make them so chaotic? Some searched for the answer. Was it the food? Was it the music? Books? Movies? Radio? Social problems? International tensions? War? Or was it comic books? Paranoia settled across the West as adults felt they could no longer trust their children. Long hair, weird clothes, the kids even seemed to have developed an entirely new language. One sprinkled with words like cool and those who were with it. Any self-respecting adult who listened into a conversation between a gaggle of these teenagers would soon be left scratching their head and looking for a translator. Though many of the dangerous social influences blamed for this new attitude seemed intangible, one proved very much on the mind of law enforcement leading into the 1950s. Crime. Today it's clear this entire process was part of a pattern one that had been repeated time and again, but perhaps not in the way you'd assume. Whenever adults start complaining about kids and skyrocketing crime rates, there's almost always a cause for their fear, and it's one right under their nose. In the 19th century, people started reading cheap, mass-produced newspapers, magazines and journals. These new forms of media exploded into the lives of the average citizen, who devoured them in a way never witnessed before. As the technology improved and became more affordable to fill the growing demand for these products and cash in on the craze, the more traditional publishing houses were soon joined by dozens, then hundreds of fly-by-night businesses. Soon anyone with a desire and a printing press could publish a newspaper, pamphlet or book, and their rise meant the standards of the industry collapsed. Without the vast resources of the established newspapers, many of these new publishers printed not only news, but gossip rumour, and even occasionally stoop to inventing a few stories to fill their pages. This sensationalism often captured the imagination of their readers and proved highly profitable. Who cares if the story wasn't exactly true, as more often than not, it was impossible to confirm a story anyway. This often led to the most outrageous printed lies being accepted as fact. These cheaper publications proved so lucrative they cut into the profit margins of the traditional publishing houses, who consequently could no longer afford the large staff needed to keep the quality of their journalism up. To cut costs, these began reducing staff, meaning the stands of these stories suffered. Desperate to feed their papers, editors filled pages with anything they could, and what were the easiest stories to find? Local articles like murder, theft, fights, and arguments were easy enough to get and made for fascinating reading. As newspapers were easily shipped and transport links improved, soon papers from other cities, states, and countries began crossing borders in a way they never had before. 
These papers would be snatched up by desperate editors hungry for content, who reprinted many of the more shocking stories contained within to help their circulation. It did not matter if the newspapers were out of date. Now your local tabloid not only contained news from your hometown and home state, but neighboring states and even the world. This meant local crime stories that had once remained local were now being read by the average person across the globe, making the world seem far more dangerous than it had before. Of course, nothing had actually changed. Now they were only reading about murders, thefts and assaults from regions that in reality had nothing to do with them. Before newspapers, these crimes would have still occurred, just most people would have remained oblivious to them. With its growing influence on people's lives, the printing press was the most important technology in the world. And then came the telegraph. Wires spread across the globe like spiderwebs, and the news that tap, tap, tapped its way down their metal cores could appear almost instantaneously anywhere in the world. Never before had humanity joined forces to pass information to each other the way it did when submarine cables were laid across the ocean floors between continents. The very first telegraph cable was laid in 1850 between London and Paris. And after a short conversation between Queen Victoria and Napoleon III, a fisherman accidentally cut the line and it fell dead. In 1866, a cable across the Atlantic connected the old world to the new. And then in 1872, a telegraph cable was laid between Asia and Australia. It wouldn't be until 30 years later, when a cable was laid across the Pacific, that the entire globe was encircled by almost instantaneous communication. For the first time in human history, the news of the day actually became the news of the day. Whatever was happening, wherever it was happening, as long as there was a telegraph line nearby, the entire world heard about it. The technology became so important, all too soon there were very few places not close to a telegraph. And of course the media cycle was triggered again. New reports from across the globe flooded in and it must have felt like crime rates were on the rise once more. Of course, nothing again had changed, only instead of reading in the paper about events that were weeks, if not months old, now this news occurred days ago. The world had just become far more immediate. No sooner had the Telegraph established itself as the most important media conveyance in the world than its day was done. Wires were no longer being rolled out across continents. They were now being wrapped in tight bundles, placed in vacuum sealed tubes and fed huge quantities of electricity. Not only did this make them glow like mini suns, it also helped them capture and send radio waves. Newspapers were under pressure as radio became everyone's media of choice. Households scrimped and saved, and soon even the poorest home had at least one radio set. The original stations producing the program for these sets soon became dozens as more local-based, less powerful radio stations appeared. Stories could now be broadcast immediately into homes, often with journalists on the spot, reporting to the listener exactly what was happening in real time. Meanwhile, more powerful broadcast systems were created, along with ever larger aerials reaching high into the sky. The closer to heaven a tower was, the further it could broadcast and the more people it could reach. Like the Telegraph had, radio broadcasters quickly spread across the planet. Thanks to a growing stable of dramatic, children, historic, educational, current affairs and comedic programs, as well as live sporting, social and political events, information was now spreading at a faster rate than at any time in history. Once more there was a growing sense the world had just become a little bit smaller and even more dangerous. Bank heists, wars, murders, beatings, riots. Stories of all these crimes poured out of the glowing radio set sitting in everyone's living room. Only this time it was possible to hear the urgency, the panic, the distress in the voice of the newsreader in a way no newspaper could ever capture. Nothing of course had changed. It just seemed like it had. Immediacy replaced curiosity as the dramatic quality of radio fed the paranoia and fear of the listener. Radio broadcasts could also be interrupted in a way no newspaper article could. Breaking news would cut directly into whatever people were listening to at the time, giving the station's audience a sense of proximity, that whatever was happening was happening close by and they or their loved ones could be in peril. Radio removed the detachment of reading about a past event by broadcasting an event at the very instance it occurred and in far more vivid detail. Radio became so important to everyday life, it was felt it could never die and then it died. It was considered a fad, one so expensive it could never become marketable. Within a few years of its development, it would spread across the globe and almost all other media forms would be forgotten in its wake, leaving television as king. 
the cycle, of course, started again. Quality soon gave way to quantity, and local TV news reports were joined with national, then international stories as the medium grew and became more sophisticated. TV was like radio, but with images. If a picture tells a thousand words, how many of the words once held in newspapers and magazines were now being received every day by people thanks to TV in a far shorter time? What would be more horrifying? Reading a story about a murder from six weeks ago, hearing about a recent murder on the radio, or seeing a murder occur before your eyes on TV? Television affected society in a way nothing had before. Perhaps only fire beats TV as the most important human invention. TV was so powerful it even dominated the mass medias that followed it. Computers, the internet, satellite communication, all have been co-opted by TV. Even the medium's reputation has remained untarnished. Rock and roll, video games, the web, all were thought to be dangerous when they first appeared and were blamed for society's woes, but rarely was TV. Humanity loves TV, and though it is constantly being refined and improved, its presence in our lives is as strong today as ever before. These new technologies have advanced the flow of information at such a rate and in such a quantity that they'd simply overwhelm those from the age of print. How could somebody whose view of the world came through a crudely printed newspaper handle the relentless, bombarding imagery of TV tied with the internet today? How dangerous would the world seem with instant images of rockets being fired into cities, bushfires devouring forests, mudslides eating villages, medics carrying wounded into waiting ambulances, police pursuits, helicopters and APCs filing past hordes of desperate refugees and starving children with lifeless eyes crying as flies wandered in and out of noses and open mouths. Not to mention vessels streaming across the open ocean firing harpoons into desperate whales. School shootings, revolutions, killings, genocide, explosions, gunshots, stabbings, mutilations. Just how dangerous do you think they would find our world today? And how more dangerous is it really to theirs? Crime rates drop, along with mortality rates and accident figures. Meanwhile, life expectancy rises, as does the quality of those lives. A common cold is no longer something to be feared. Surgery is so commonplace, they produce reality shows about it. And the stars that were never visible due to the chimney smoke from the fires of thousands of houses that made up the crushed, cramped cities they came from, well, humanity has now danced amongst those stars. The world is, and always has been, a dangerous place. But statistics show year by year, decade by decade, it gets safer. Crime rates are falling. Children are far more respectful than they ever have been before. Sure, their music is terrible and almost a crime by itself, but that's hardly the end of Western civilization. Technology does not increase crime. It just increases the amount we personally witness. Do a little experiment tonight and watch the news. But remove all international and interstate stories and note exactly how much is left. To give you an idea of the power of the modern media, as I write this, my TV has been interrupted by a breaking story of a terrorist attack on a coffee shop in Sydney, Australia. If you are an international reader, did your own news report this story? I am now watching live footage of people escaping from the building under siege. This feels immediate, concerning, and literally has nothing to do with me as I live 400 kilometers away. This chapter was brought to you by Horror, the first time America's paranoia infected the world. Horror is now available at Marcosia Publishing and on Amazon. The music was Depth of Focus by Shane Ivers. The alarm clock ticked loudly at the side of their bed, and while Francesco snored like a Buzz saw clearing a rainforest, Stanley lay awake. It wasn't his partner who was the cause of his insomnia, for Stanley could doze through the wildest storm. In fact, Stanley was only sound asleep ten minutes prior, until he thought he heard someone whisper in his ear. The arms of his alarm clock inched their way toward the number twelve. He sat up and, shortly after, stood and took his dressing gown from the bedpost. He remembered hearing the word eternal in the sentence that was murmured to him, but the rest of the phrase was hazy. Numerous cats meowed in unison. Stanley was unnerved. He strode to the living room and casually opened the curtain. 
Several feline gangs gathered on the front lawn. An eerie wind shook the trees as the cat strolled to the centre of the garden. The voice whispered again, and Stanley instantly felt drowsy. He sauntered back to the bedroom and fell on top of the sheets. In his slumber, his dreams began. And in this personal movie, he sat at a small round table in a circular room. A crimson curtain wrapped itself around the space. A crisp white tablecloth fell just above his knees, and embossed on a shiny gold card in the middle of the table were the words reserved. The Midnight Man. There were other tables too, all with the same small card and all with either a mature age man or woman sitting at them. The only difference was, each of these people were dining and chatting with a younger male companion. He noted the dress code. Every man, young or old, sported a dinner suit. Stanley also wore one. Each lady was adorned in a stylish black dress. Excuse me, sir. This voice startled Stanley. The boy was it sexy. Its honey-rich timber could invite you to a murder and you'd stay under its spell until the moment the knife was placed in your hand. Stanley looked up to see whose voice it was. A young man stood with his hands in his trouser pockets. His smile sent Stan's thoughts spinning. He measured up to all the best-looking groomsmen Stanley had admired at the various weddings he'd attended. Most of the time it was the best man Stan fancied, especially if they were still playing the field. He'd stare at them, wishing to be swept off his feet and carried down the aisle. The Midnight Man had a crew cut. It's a cliché to say it was a preferred style of boy-next-door types, but for Stan, it sealed the deal. Something classic. Something captivating. Something familiar enough to help him not feel old. Are you hungry? Asher asked. Should I ask the waiter for a menu? I'm looking forward to sitting here and listening to your tales. Strangely, I, I don't have an appetite. Me neither. They were the only people in the room now. Maybe your dream needs a change of pace. Asher stood. Follow me to enchantment, or something close to it. Stanley did as he was told. Through the crimson curtain was an opening. As they ventured through the darkness to the other side, music broke through the silence. The floor shook with each beat. The murmur of a crowd brought back many memories for Stanley, and as the laser lights flashed random colours into the void, the crowd became visible. Everyone was Asher's age. Stanley reached for Asher's hand to lead him through this curious scene, and they were both dressed differently. Asher wore a blue t-shirt as he strode toward the DJ. Stanley wore a waistcoat adorned with tiny roses, buttoned tight to expose his chest. He looked down at the smiling quarter moon, the oversized design on his belt buckle. He stomped his foot. His shoes were sturdy, leather, and unmistakably British. It's perfect in every way, he thought. He could feel a change. First, the music. It sounded hollow, as if someone had played around with an equaliser and they got it all wrong. Then, like a jet engine, it soared. Next, awareness of his own lanky shape was replaced by a oneness with everyone in that huge hall. There were no creaky joints or sagging skin. Decades disappeared. A sense of love so overwhelming consumed him. Then it hit full charge. The need to dance. The want to take off his waistcoat and sense the sweat, the pleasure and the energy that took control. He was lost in sensation. He was lost in thoughts that highlighted every positive thing about himself. He hadn't felt this for a long time. And Asher was the best part of this charge. A boy at the start of the finest years of his life young enough to be sought after and brave enough to seek love from those who fall under his spell. And guys nearby were eyeing Stanley. One seemed familiar, a lover Stanley recalled for his kindness at a time when he was finding himself. This guy waved at Stanley. The gesture was returned with an air kiss. Coming toward them was a guy who sported small mirror tiles on his shoulders, as if he was a walking disco ball. He had similarly mirrored shorts, and he also held a mirror. 
To Stanley, this guy wore the face of a human hiding his hurt, someone wishing others would understand his sadness, yet too polite to talk about his feelings or cry until there were no more tears, a feeling too familiar. Stanley raised his arms and shook his butt, encouraging Mirror Man to find his bliss. For a moment, the guy laughed. A door was open, ready for pain to be released. He swung his hips, making his way towards Stanley, so Stanley raised his arms higher to transmit love in all directions. Then the guy held a mirror to Stanley's face. There it was. No denying it. Stanley was not 21 again. He was nearly 50, a man in need of maturity. What is it? Asha asks. I'm not meant to be here. Stanley sat startled as he found himself opposite Asha back at the restaurant. Both were wearing suits again. So tell me, Stan, where are you meant to be? So this is an excerpt from my first book called One Summer in Santorini. It's also the first book in the Holiday Romance series. And we're joining Sarah. She's had a terrible heartbreak, a terrible breakup, and she's taken herself off to Santorini. And she's about to join a sailing trip well that where they'll sail around the Cycladi. So chapter three. As the bus lurched along the dusty, winding roads of Santorini, I watched the cute American with considerable interest from behind my duty-free Prada sunglasses. He seemed anxious, as though he might be on the wrong bus or something. For all I knew, I was on the wrong bus. I realized my usual MO would be to panic all the way to Vlicada or wherever we were going, but there was something about handling the stolen wallet ordeal the night before that put the whole wrong bus thing into a more realistic perspective. And if the bus didn't go to the marina, I'd ride it back to Fira and start again. I focused my attention back on the American, who was even better looking up close than he'd seemed from across the square the day before. He was also far younger than he'd seemed initially. Like, maybe 22? 22 was way too young for anyone I would get involved with or even have a fleeting holiday flirtation with, and besides, I wasn't looking. I wondered if the cute American would be joining my sailing trip. We were the only two non-Greek people on the bus and it didn't seem as though Vlakada was somewhere where frequented by tourists, so it was looking possible if not likely. If he was going to be on the trip, that led to an important question. Would we become friends? I decided that if we were sailing together for the next 10 days, then yes, there was a good chance we would become friends, unless he was a dickhead. He didn't look like a dickhead. But you can never be too sure until you actually meet a person. And even if you did meet someone and decide they weren't a dickhead, they still might be and it might take you 11 and a half months to figure it out. I knew this from experience. By the way, Neil the cheating bastard is the dickhead in this scenario. I dismissed the thoughts of Neil. I was getting much better at that. Instead, I let it wander to happier places as I imagined a lifetime of friendship with a cute American. After the trip, we would become pen pals, writing actual letters back and forth for years. Then we would go to each other's weddings, and over the next few decades, share all our major life events via letters and phone calls. During our widowed twilight years, we would live in the same city in side-by-side -side houses, all the while denying we were more than just friends. The bus groaned to a stop at a marina. I stopped daydreaming and looked out, at the dirty, looked out the dirty bus window, seeing a sign that made me smile. Flicada. I was in the right place. See, no need to worry. I gathered up my stuff and got off the bus via the back door and the cute American got off via the front door, swinging his duffel bag over his shoulder. The bus pulled away and we were the only two people standing on the pier. We looked at each other for a moment, then I walked back towards him, or walked over towards him, awkwardly because my wretched backpack was swinging heavily against my legs. Hello, I said. Hi, he replied. So far, this was an excellent conversation. It seemed my witty repartee from a few hours before had completely dried up, so I figured I'd get straight to the point. Are you on the sailing trip? Oh, thank God I'm in the right place, he blurted. Then he seemed to chastise himself. He walked over to me with his hand outstretched, 
Hi, sorry, I was a little worried I was on the wrong bus. I shook his hand. Firm handshake. Nice. No worries. I was too, to be honest. I lied. I'm Sarah. Josh. I was right, by the way. American. I picked his accent as Midwestern, but I didn't ask. We had ten days to learn about each other, and I was sure we'd get there eventually. Shall we try to find the boat, he suggested. Good plan. My backpack was getting heavier the longer we stood there. We walked towards the rows of moored boats discussing how we would know which one was ours when Josh spotted a flag fluttering from one of the masts and pointed to it. That must be it, us. It had the tour company's logo on it, so we headed in that direction. Hang on, I said, stopping short. There's two. Look. He followed the line of my arm to another of the company's flags waving at us from a mast. Huh. Well, let's go to one. If it's not right, then we'll go to the other. Okay, by this stage, I didn't care what boat I was on. I wanted to put down my cumbersome backpack. Stupid bloody thing. We came to the first, two, first of the two yachts, which was docked parallel to the pier. It was about 15 meters long, and like most boats, the bulk of it was white. Struck me how, struck me how little I knew about sailing and boats, as I really couldn't point out any distinguishing features. It looked like a sailboat. We both dropped our bags onto the pier, and Josh called out, Hello! A head popped out of the hatch, followed by some shoulders, then a torso and the rest of a man's body. Hello, he said back. He was handsome in the way that Harrison Ford was handsome when he played Indiana Jones the first couple of times. I couldn't help making note of how many good-looking men I was running into on Santorini. Hi, I'm Gary. Hi, Gary. Sarah, this is Josh. Gary turned around and called down into the boat. Duncan, the last door here. To us, he said, oh, I'm not the skipper. I'm the, I'm on the tour like you, although I do know quite a bit about sailing. Oh, good to know that if the skipper falls overboard, we can keep on going, quip Josh. <laughs> Funny. Gary offered us an unsure smile in response and joined us on deck as another head popped up out of the hatch. Josh and Sarah, said the head. Yes, we said in unison. Great. The second man, who I presume was Duncan, leapt into action. He climbed out of the hatch jumped off the boat and onto the pier and grabbed both our bags as though they weighed nothing. He climbed back onto the boat and said, Come aboard! Oh, and shoes off. Then he disappeared back below the deck. He was spry, I'd given that. In fact, the whole exchange happened so quickly, I caught myself standing and staring into a black hole where he disappeared. Well, I guess we found the right, bo right boat, Josh said to me quietly. Absolutely, I replied. I slipped off my sandals and climbed over the railing onto the boat. It was a little trickier than I would have liked because I was wearing a short skirt. I hoped I wasn't flashing my knickers to all and sundry. I noticed with an I, no, I noticed an amused smile on Josh's face as he reached out to help. Was it smugness or chivalry? I took his hand regardless. I didn't want to fall into the water on my first day. Or ever, for that matter. Gary spoke up. There's actually two boats leaving from here tomorrow morning. That's the other one over there. He pointed to the second boat that Josh and I had seen from the end of the pier. Oh, well, we'll... Will we be sailing with them, I asked. No, not really, but we'll likely run into them from time to time. All women, apparently. He laughed to himself. I think our mix of people will be far better. Hey, Josh. He gave Josh what looked like a knowing grin. What was this? The men folk conspiring already? And how were Josh and I to know what the mix was? We'd only met Gary and Duncan. Oh, God, I hope I'm not the only woman. Josh, to his credit, answered Gary with a noncommittal shrug. I went below deck and Josh followed. It was so dark I couldn't see anything and then I remembered I was wearing my sunglasses so I flipped them on top of my head. I could see better but only marginally. It was pretty dark down below deck. Duncan emerged from one of the cabins and soon after two women appeared from two other cabins. I wasn't the only woman then. Gary also climbed down and then there were six of us standing in the cramped dining nook looking at each other. Oh, said the man breaking the awkward silence. I didn't introduce me. Sorry, I'm Duncan. I'm your skipper. Australian, Queenslander for sure. I waved at him from two metres away. And this is Hannah and Marie, and you've met Gary, Marie's husband. So the Harrison Ford guy was married. I wasn't particularly disappointed as he wasn't really my type, a little too blokish. And besides, I wasn't looking. I smiled at the strangers I would be living with for the next 10 days. And these two are Josh and Sarah, added Duncan to finish the round of introduction. I'm Sarah, he's Josh, I added in an attempt to break the ice, and thankfully everyone laughed. Then the tiny space erupted into activity. Hannah came forward and said, Hello, you're sharing with me. Uh, in there, she pointed to the left rear cabin. Come on, I'll show you. She sounded Canadian, but Vancouver, I'd guessed. I followed her the extremely short distance to our cabin and she showed me the highlights. It was a tight space, but at least we had our own bathroom. There were two bunks, one very narrow and about a meter from the ceiling, and the lower one, which took up the width of the cabin. 
Whoever slept on the top bunk would have to climb onto it from the bottom bunk. Some of Hannah's things were on that bunk, so I guess the lower one was mine. We also had a hatch in the ceiling and a porthole for fresh air. The camel was tiny but clean and it would be fine. I doubted I'd be spending much time there anyway. It was just for sleeping and showering. Sarah, can I ask you a question? Sure, I said as I unzipped my backpack and started pulling stuff out. How come you're not sleeping with your boyfriend? What? I looked at her in surprise. What on earth was she talking about? Josh, how come you two aren't sharing a cabin? Oh, I said, probably too loudly for the con confined space of a boat. I'd seen Josh disappear in the cabin next door and realized he could be listening. I lowered my voice. He's not my boyfriend. I just met him like five minutes ago on the pier. We were on the same bus to the marina, that's all, so yeah. I finished feebly. Oh, I thought you guys were a couple. <laughs> no, and believe me, if he was my boyfriend, I wouldn't want to sleep with him. Great. I sounded desperate or sex-starved, or both. She gave me a funny look, confirming it was both. I'm going to head up top. Duncan's making another round of cocktails, and then he's going over the trip information. I'll see you up there. What the hell was the thing I'd said about wanting to sleep with Josh? I didn't want to sleep with him. He was a baby. No, an infant. And I wasn't going anywhere near him. Even if he was cute, I wasn't going, going near any men. At most, I might admire them, and only from afar. I had to get it together. I didn't want Hannah thinking she was sharing her cabin with a nymphomaniac weirdo. Anyway, so that's from the start of One Summer in Santorini. There are three books in the series out at the moment, and there are two to come. Um, the next one is called Under Bali Skies, and that's coming at the beginning of 2022. And we're rounding out the series with a wedding in Tuscany. So there's lots of wonderful characters and um, side characters who get their own books eventually. Um, anyway, so check them out. Thanks. Hi, I'm Verity Croker and I write young adult novels as well as adult novels and chapter books. Today I'm going to read from my latest young adult novel, Jewel Des Arc, published by Harmony Inc. Press in the US. Chapter one. Strong hands hold me high, and I can feel myself teetering over the edge of the metal rail. The wind whips my hair around and flicks it into my eyes. Am I really going to end up in the icy looking water far below, or are they bluffing? I hear a cry, stop, stop, let her down. It's the captain who has followed us and is right behind the men. Think about what you're doing. She's a human being who has done no harm. Tell us where we are going, yells one of my captors, and we will let her go. A chant begins with others on the deck joining in. Where are we going? Where are we going? Some people start to clap and stomp their feet in rhythm with the words, and soon the noise is deafening. Where are we going? Where are we going? The captain finally understands they really mean business. I feel myself being lifted higher, my toes now barely touching the top of the railing. The men are holding me by my calves and wrists, and it's all I can do to try and keep my balance. I'm swaying so much. Suddenly I'm pushed, but my fall is broken as rough hands keep gripping my ankles. My face thumps into the side of the ship below the railing, and I can feel blood pour hot from my nose. I'm hanging upside down outside the railing and I'm screaming and bawling at the same time, stomach rolling. My fists beat against the metallic hull of the ship. How has our tropical island holiday turned into such horror? My name is Stephen Irwin Fine and the title of my novel is Will you keep me tomorrow? Thank you for having me on board. I'm reading just two pages from chapter two from my novel, which was inspired by real life events in my own life. A few minutes before reaching Sassafras, while cruising up the hill on Mount Dandenong tourist road, the vehicle's headlights captured a fleeting glimpse of something odd that caught his eye. 
He continued for a few hundred meters more before he decided to turn around and investigate. He had no idea why, but something made him curious. Whatever it was, it really looked out of place. When he neared the strange shaped object, he saw a driveway up ahead and managed to do a U-turn and pulled up behind. In the car lights, he saw a fox scurrying for safety and disappear into the dark undergrowth. It almost looked irritable and disappointed. He put the car into park mode and left the engine purring. He cautiously approached the dark object. He nearly broke the world high jump record when he heard the desperate cry. His heart beat loudly as he gathered his senses and covered his mouth in total disbelief. He peered into the basket and in the shadows of the car lights he saw a tiny baby, pale and nearly blue from the freezing cold. The temperature was dropping rapidly and would be close to freezing during the night. Chester Jones already felt the chill on his cheeks and his nose the moment he stepped out of his new Audi. He saw a soft dirty toy that looked like it had been a cute, fluffy little cola bear when it was new. His heart was thumping, his throat felt dry, and the palms of his hands were damp like the dandelion dew. The baby cried again. Its cry was hoarse from the exposure, and God knows how long it had been there. The little one looked at him with desperate, lonely, empty eyes. Chester guessed it could not be more than a few weeks old. Gently, he touched the child and could feel it was sopping wet. Shocked, he looked around nervously, as though expecting to see whoever had done this horrible deed. No one was in sight. His mind was racing. He was confused and perplexed that any human being could dump a baby at the side of the road like this. He started shaking, his teeth chattering from the cold and shock, and it sounded like a machine gun going off in the distance. He had to get the baby to the nearest hospital or police station so they could launch an immediate investigation and get the urgent medical treatment the infant obviously needed. A few cars occasionally passed by while he considered what to do, but they ignored Chester's Audi on the side of the road. As Chester was looking around amongst the overgrown ferns looking for clues, a vehicle pulled up alongside Chester's car. You all right there, mate? A deep voice shouted from within the vehicle. Chester nervous, but revealing his find to a stranger, had to think fast. Yeah, Chester waved. All good, just taking a leak, mate. No worries, man, the concerned driver said and drove off. As soon as the road was empty and no headlights were in view, Chester picked up the bassinet gently and carried it to his car. He opened the passenger door and placed the wet and smelly baby on the seat. He quickly removed his cashmere coat and covered the freezing little one. He shut the door and jumped behind the wheel. He found another place to turn around and floored the accelerator towards the police station he had noticed on the way up. Chester's head was spinning, but he had one clear thought, and that was to get the baby to safety. The baby whimpered. It was obviously very weak and the overpowering cocktail smell of urine, fecal matter and vomit permeated the brand new interior of the car. Hush, little one, hush, shh, shh, shh. Chester tried to soothe and placate the infant while trying to keep the terror he felt out of his voice. He glanced at the speedometer. He was doing 100 kilometers an hour in a 60 kilometer our zone, limit zone, and immediately tapped the brakes up and down as he saw the bright blue sign of the police station appear just a few hundred yards on his left ahead. Slowing down, he turned his indicator on. But then something happened. In an instant, he turned it off and then increased his speed again and headed straight for home. He nervously glanced in his rearview mirror to see by some chance if a police car might be behind him or if anybody was following him. He suddenly realized what this could mean to him and Megan. The foundling had gone quiet and Chester was worried. He looked over to see if the baby was still alive. It wasn't moving. He turned up the volume of a song playing on FM. The baby didn't stir. He cranked the volume even louder and louder until it was deafening. Suddenly the baby began to cry again and he turned the volume down. Its tiny rough voice was pitiful. 
The poor thing was dehydrated, its mouth so dry it had no more saliva. Chester hit the speed button and called his brother. Lance, Lance, listen, he said as soon as his brother answered. What's the matter, Chester? You sound so nervous. Are you all right? You wouldn't believe it. I've got a baby. I just found an abandoned baby on the roadside in the Dandenong Ranges. Just be at my place in 20 minutes and bring your medical kit. The little thing is cold, wet, and he paused. I think slipping away. Chester hung up before Lance could ask any questions and rerouted his journey to Turek. Then he called the mining magnet. He apologized profusely and told him he had a puncture and, before, and because it was late, he needed to return home. He would see him in the near future and would hang on to the special gift until then. The mining tycoon was completely understanding. And that was three pages from Will You Keep Me Tomorrow by Stephen Owen Fine. Thank you. Chapter 2. The Cairns Declaration Please let him go, said Matt, voice hollow with fear. The alien dragged a struggling cameraman closer. It raised its fearful leaf wings. It flourished its antenna, focused its many eyes upon him, and said, rather unexpectedly, Please to resume duties. The shadows had lengthened in the short tropical twilight. The day's heat began to slip away and the sly, unsporting insects of the evening sharpened their fangs and waited. The world held its breath. Like the worst call centre helpline ever, and with the familiar voice of Siri, the creature said, Declaration of Right, underutilised solar energy. The set was so quiet, Matt heard the thing rustle, as it adjusted the thin green structures that came to be called leaf wings. It directed its many eye stalks at both the camera and the cast and continued to speak. Light foragers of planet be sentient. Matt dragged his eyes from Taylor's body slumped against the table leg. He dropped the fork he found unexpectedly in his hand and directed a confused look at the vet. Paul mouthed, plants, plants are smart. Cease, slay, consume them. Matt flinched as the killer of the two women abruptly folded its leaf wings shut. Its eye stalks turned towards its companion, its feelers rippled. The companion edged closer to the camera and said, especially trees. Matt edged closer to Kalinda, their thighs touching as the creature alternatively flared open, then closed its wings. It thrashed its feelers at its companion, then stalked away to the rainforest edge. Matt took a relieved breath, and the nearer alien turned from the camera and said to the celebrities, Advise humans enhance like corals. Kalinda's eyebrows knitted with concern. What? she whispered. Matt shrugged. It wants us to like corals more? It was hardly the most crucial part of what became known as the Cairns Declaration, but the message seemed consistent with the city's status as the gateway to the Great Barrier Reef. As the business community could attest, visitors were welcome in a wide variety of shapes and colours, provided they possessed a clean bill of health, a disposable income and a ticket home. It was a question of intentions, tourism, invasion, settlement or colonisation. As the indigenous peoples of the area could attest, the English word colonise is an irregular verb, the bane of all language learning. I colonise, you invade, we civilise, you will go away please. It soon became obvious the visitors were staying. It was a clear case of an irregular verb situation.
Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds, including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.